kick this meeting off. Okay. All right, I'll take this one. But we have two awesome speakers today, two really good sessions. We're going to talk about dashboard design and Tableau prep. And I will let Nelson cover what is coming um, this summer. What do you have planned, yeah. Nelson? So we're super excited to announce a date, uh, not necessarily a location, not a lot of details, but um, we are going to uh, be helping to host a big in-person gathering. Uh, we're going to be working with Libby Adams, who is a co-founder of Alteryx, um, and she and the team at Alteryx are going to be hosting a Tableau and Alteryx Better Together big blowout in-person party uh, on July the 12th. Uh, it will be here in Atlanta. Uh, so uh, great opportunity for you to meet uh, like uh, an amazing woman who's done amazing things in the space today and technology, uh, co-founder of Alteryx. Um, we got to talk with her uh, about a month back and she's just phenomenal. So she's going to be there. Um, we're all going to be there. It's going to be amazing. You don't want to miss it. Um, it's going to be uh, absolutely fantastic. Um, hoping to have you know many hundreds of folks. We're going to have a fantastic venue. Um, so I think kind of late afternoon, um, happy hour, come hang out, meet some people, um, you know, scratch the itch of not being able to be in person. Um, it should be really fun. So more details to come. That sounds like fun. I feel like sometimes the, um, the virtual meetings are great for like getting in the content. There's a lot of advantages, virtual, you're not having to commute and everything, but you miss the connections and the community. And like, this could be a really great opportunity to just like reconnect with other ATUG members and see people we haven't seen in a long time. Um, so this is cool. I'm looking forward to that. Miss people's faces, like in person. Miss your face. We see yeah. each other, but I can't see anyone else. Unfortunately, the way that our format's set up. Okay. Yeah, we... I miss your face, and I miss I miss the squeeze. <laughs> <laughs> Virtual hug. <clears throat> so, this slide was a prompt for us to go ahead and ask everyone um, if you're looking for a a job, if you have a job um, that you've posted at your company, if you're looking to hire someone, it would be a great chance to just put something in the chat. And I think Jen is going to post a link on LinkedIn. There's been several jobs posted recently on the ATUG page. So if you haven't checked it yet, it's a good resource if you're looking for work or if you have a position that you need to fill. Yes, lots of movement of good people around analysts. Yep. It's a hot, hot job market demand. right now, isn't it? Yeah. It is. It is. So hot right now. So hot right now. <laughs> <clears throat> so we got to say big congratulations to Juana. Oh, big congrats. <gasps> if you guys haven't seen this viz, it's amazing. I actually... Am I the only one that didn't know what the amen break was? Did you I guys didn't. know? I had no, no idea. idea. Ryan, have you ever no heard idea. of it? I had never, I had never heard of it, but um, I thought this was really well done. And um, not only did it win visit of the day, but um, Juana was a top 10 finalist in for Iron Viz this year. So congratulations, Juana. That is awesome. That's absolutely fantastic. I just looked, she's not on, but ah. everybody go to her LinkedIn after this and give her a big congratulatory high five uh, yes. or ladder up on Twitter. <clears throat> okay, and we would, we obviously have to mention TC. So coming up next month, we have the conference and it's in Vegas. It will also be virtual. Um, but it's great that, you know, there will finally be an in-person option for those who want to attend, who can make it to Vegas. It's going to be a much smaller conference, but, um, but some of us will, will be out there. Make sure you post in the chat if, if you're planning to attend or if you're going to watch virtually. Um, here are a list of the community speakers, and Jared is listed on here. 
Jay, yeah, do you want to mention what your session is? Yep. So uh, late last year and early this year, I did 100 days of the prep and data challenges. And so my session is going to be about um, what prep and data is, how the challenges come about, and then my experience going through the 100 days and what I learned. Oh, that sounds cool. Can't wait. You're, you're totally amazing. Every time I think about that, I get shivers. <clears throat> Yeah, all of the sessions are now online, so they're out there. You can't completely build your schedule. It, not all of the times are out there, but you can get a really good, all the details are, are online. And the Vizies will mm. also be a part of PC this year. So um, there is a survey um, that you can take, just like a Google form. And you can nominate others like all across the Tableau community for things like best viz of the year, um, hackiest. I mean, there's just like all these different categories. So definitely check this out. You can even nominate. I want to say I did it earlier this week. It's like 10 people per category. Wow. So you can really like add a lot of people in. So a great way to recognize people that are are not a Zen, uh, Zen Tableau visionary and master um, that's the one thing you can't do, but everybody else is fair game and it gives people a chance to get recognized. And, um, I have to mention that there's a chance to vote for the tug of the year. So it is your duty and obligation, obviously, <laughs> <laughs> as an ATUG member to go on here and vote for ATUG. You have to vote Atlanta. So yeah. Vote early and vote sure often, vote. people. Let's yes. make this thing happen. <laughs> <laughs> it is the last question so we must uh finish the drill in order to get there that's right who else is gonna get that i can't, I can't <laughs> fathom that anybody else is even mentioned in that <clears throat> we should be like the 11 time winner of that award <clears throat> i agree i agree yeah we are very humble here in atlanta <laughs> <laughs> um so y'all so many good things happening as we've uh, just mentioned you know you've got uh the next kind of uh opportunity is may in person or virtual for the tableau conference so we're going to skip that month uh we will be back uh virtually uh in june so that's the 16th um we had already said we were not going to do like a a tug um of sorts like a normal tug in july um but the opportunity now to do the in-person event with all tricks. Um, so everybody's invited, invite your friends should be awesome. We'll get back to things in August. Um, and we were anticipating the conference to be in November. And so that's why there's nothing in there. Uh, but actually the kind of December, November thing, uh, we just go early December and that kind of covers both months. So boom. Exactly. I believe Brian will be going first as our very first speaker. Um, Brian works for Central Garden and Pet. He is the director of sales and business performance there. Brian, would you like to tell a little about yourself? And I'll let you share your screen as well. Thank you for being uh, here. Sure, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Karen. Uh, thanks for having me. Thanks, uh, ATUG, for having me here. I'm super excited to, uh, to share some uh, dashboard design tips with you today. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to go off of camera while I'm presenting here. It kind of gets distracting for me to <laughs> share slides. And Brian, I respect that brave well. shirt you got going on there, buddy. That's fantastic. Hey, you got it. Hey, world champions. Up. World champions. All right. Can you see my slides? It's just fine. We got you. Looks great. We can. All right. Great. So, um, you know, I, I'm here to talk about not the not the latest trends in dashboard designs. I'm not going to tell you the the uh, beauty that you can have through long form or the aesthetic profiles of dark dashboards. So I want to, I want to show you the most basic tips that I possibly can. And, you know, all the Tableau is my favorite platform for dashboarding. This talk is not tailored for any specific software. I actually only mentioned Tableau again, specifically a few times later in the presentation. Uh, the concepts here apply pretty much universally to any analytical platform. These are kind of things to, uh, to consider and apply for as long as you continue building dashboards. So a quick look at our topics. Uh, after a brief introduction to Central and myself, uh, we will talk through consideration of these uh, three broad dashboard design uh, concepts. 
uh, inverted pyramid, intentional choices, prioritizing simplicity, and last, I'll share some resources. So first, quick introduction to Central Garden and Pet. Um, your market leader in the lawn and garden and pet industries. Uh, we bring to market dozens of brands, some of which you may have heard of before. Uh, corporate headquarters is in Walnut Creek, uh, California. I work in the garden segment, which is based here in Atlanta and which represented about two fifths of the company's revenue uh, in our last fiscal year. Uh, as I mentioned, I work for the garden segment. These are uh, most of our major brands represented on screen here. Uh, pet segment, uh, KT, Nylabone, Four Paws, and Zilla are just a few of our pet brands you might recognize. So uh, I encourage you to visit central.com to learn more about the company and our family and brands if you're interested. And a little bit about myself. Um, I'm Brian Ellison. You can find me on the Twitter and Tableau Public at BizGuyBry. I'll tell you right now, though, my portfolio has been, um, I've been out there a while to admire and learn from others' work, but haven't really taken uh, the leap yet to grow my own public presence. And next month, I'll be celebrating uh, 11 years with Central Garden and Pet, uh, but I've got over 20 years diverse analytical experience in uh, banking, retail, and consumer goods uh, across a variety of business functions, including marketing, sales, and executive support finance, compensation, and operations. Uh, from the beginning, I've been keenly interested in things that make one report easier to understand than another, one chart more effective than another, or one analysis more compelling than another. Uh, many of these things are considered universal best practices within the field of study called information design. Uh, Wikipedia defines information design as the practice of presenting information in a way that fosters an efficient and effective understanding of the information. But my real passion, the reason why I come to work every day, my two teenagers, Anna and Dylan, you can see us there on the right, uh, enjoying the sunset from top of the Empire State Building a uh, week before Christmas last year. And not only am I a Central Garden and Pet employee, I'm also a consumer. They're in the middle, see my garden, uh, ready for the spring season this year. And on the left are my two cats, Ash and Cole. I love putting quotes into my presentations. I think so many people have said things better before. Why well, try to restate it? When it comes to information design, this is probably my favorite quote of all time on the screen. Eight words and it says it all. I really wasn't familiar with Hans Hoffman until finding this quote. Uh, if you're not familiar, he's a German-American painter regarded as one of the most influential art teachers of the 20th century. Uh, he established the first modern school of art anywhere. His work both preceded and influenced abstract expressionism, the first specifically American art movement to achieve international influence and put New York City at the center of the Western art world instead of Paris. Now, why am I starting with a quote from artists? Well, I know many of you are already aware of the secret link that exists between art and dashboards, and some of you may be surprised to learn what I'm about to share. So what is it that artists want to be understood? What is the one essential Thing that all artists want to be understood of their work. What same thing do you and I want our dashboard viewers to understand? One basic element exists in all forms of art, from painting to music and theater. That same element you will always find in a well-designed dashboard, and it's telling a story. Now, humans have been telling stories for thousands of years. There are many tried and true frameworks you can leverage to tell your stories. But for dashboards, I have found uh, a majority of the time, one storytelling model uh, works better than the rest. That is the inverted pyramid. Now, if you ever took uh, intro to journalism or uh, mass communications class, you probably learned about the inverted pyramid. It is the classic news story model. Uh, key here is to know your audience so you can lay out the information in a way that is more interesting. And it breaks down like this. Basically, the headline or your summary is 100% of your audience. Those are the people who stop to read your article. Uh, and in the biz, they call this bottom line up front. You put the, the who, what, where, when, why up front so people can walk away after reading that initial paragraph and get the main gist of the story. That's the headline, the summary. Let's say maybe 50% of your audience is more interested and they want to go on to read more important details about the story. And then maybe even a smaller section of your audience is additionally curious and they want to go on to explore more details of the story, background information, and such. That's how the inverted uh, pyramid breaks down. And I mentioned here, key is to know your audience. So we know what 
information is considered most newsworthy versus uh, backup details and background information. Well, it just so happens that the same exact framework works perfectly for dashboard design as it does for news stories. And again, here key is to know your audience. So we put the most important in info up front uh, this is the most noteworthy information. Here you have no more than five to 10 seconds uh, to get your audience to understanding. This is where emphasis plays a key. Um, now we, we like to put a lot of stuff in charts on dashboards, uh, but sometimes you can put your KPIs and text for maximum attention, because that's gonna give your reader a, a cue to stop and read something that's important. And I've got the text uh, capitalized and in bold there uh, to, uh, signify they can put uh, KPIs in a band or a big aggregate number, as you would call them. Uh, next, you have details, uh, your secondary information, uh, charts highlighting your most relevant trends and breakouts. This is where you can help build your flow to uh, have the reader uh, know that uh, these are backup details, uh, any kind of time frame breakouts or business units breakouts they want to give. And then tertiary information, uh, this is for people uh, who want to drill down further and explore, uh, product managers to see how their individual product is doing, or sales managers drilling down to a sales story, territory. Um, you know, Putting this tertiary information one or two clicks away uh, can help obscure your headlines, or you can actually um, put some of this information in tooltips as well. Key here is prioritizing and arranging metrics logically. Right, moving on to the next quote, um, Edward Tufte, uh, also known as E.T., is the sagely prophet who, uh, in the early 80s, captured and condensed some of the most important foundational concepts on effectively displaying quantitative information. Uh, Tufte is responsible for introducing several data visualization innovations, including the Sparkline and Small Multiple. Both were designed to help the viewer understand a large amount of data by maximizing data to ink ratio, one of his most key concepts basically boils down like this. The, the proportion of ink that is used to present actual data compared to the total amount of ink or pixels used into the entire display. Basically, don't put a bunch of ink out there that isn't portraying data. This, this quote speaks to me because I think many times the failure of design is that it simply isn't considered. Um, and if you don't intentionally consider design, your information does risk being confused and cluttered. So this takes me to the tip of making intentional choices. Now, even if you're working with a software program that is uh, designed to consider best practices, default options usually need tweaks. Uh, don't expect default options to tell your story best. Things like uh, color, value precision, fonts and grid lines can make a difference. Uh, become familiar and implement best practices. So I think of best practices, I think of three groups, um, cardinal rules, design guidelines, and stylistic preferences. Cardinal rules are things that, um, for the most part, you generally do not want to break these rules. Things like uh, limited exception line charts are only used for time series data, or don't truncate the x-axis of a bar chart. Those are cardinal rules. Uh, design guidelines are things like, you know, what's the limit or how many widgets to put on a dashboard, you know, somewhere between five and seven, how many lines you want a line chart, you know, somewhere around four or five. Um, those are more kind of guidelines, you could stretch them if you need to. And the last is stylistic preferences. These are things like font choices, color choices, and spacing. Uh, these are more things about preference, what kind of style you develop over time. Uh, and to help direct your reader's emphasis, uh, what, what should get their attention in the flow or how the user should ingest your dashboard, uh, keep, in, keep in mind these three practices. Um, so for visual purposes, use the best chart types. You will get more mileage from effective use of bars and lines than you will from concepts like packed bubbles and tree maps. Uh, layout, you want to usually follow left to right, top to bottom, uh, F or Z uh, flow is the most common. And be sure that you're grouping or rela related or relevant data so your uh, user's eyes are not bouncing all around the page. And the lastly, uh, use text sparingly. Uh, titles, tables, legends, labels, axes, and headings all add to your user's cognitive load. So you want to think about optimizing uh, your data to ink ratio 
and leveraging things like a dual purpose title, right? You can include a color legend within the title. And something that I, I've noticed occurs regularly is be mindful of value precision. You know, keep in mind, do you need one decimal points, two decimal points, um, especially on an axis. If your axis is showing uh, a number like 40%, 50%, 60%, there is no need to have a 40.0%. 50.0% on the axis. Um, those small differences can really make it uh, make a difference in your cognitive load. And third quote here. Uh, this one's a little bit longer. This is uh, a Danish designer who is known for his way showing designs at several European airports. He's also responsible for coming up with the phrase way showing. Um, and he's also known for his uh, emphasis on simplicity in design. Uh, several good words in this quote, some repeated roots. Uh, we got design, explain, inform. Knowledge and action are especially important within a business context. And I'm also going to key on the phrase right there in the middle, facts of the universe. You know, what does that even mean? Right? Well, you know, for design to airports, so let's think about the airport. Think about you're traveling on an air journey. What do you need to know at each stage of your travel? Think about there's a different universe depending on where you are in your journey and your individual needs. When you show up to the airport, right? You you don't care where, um, you know, your ground transportation is necessary, right? You already got there. You, you, you probably either wanna get your ticket if you haven't already, check your bags or go to security. There's really only a few options that you have available to you. And, and when you arrive, you know, it depends on do you have a connecting flight? Do you need to know where your next gate is? Are you leaving the airport? Do you know where Grand Transportation is? Um, so there's a limited amount of choices to you along the way, uh, so that minimizes your your universe as you're uh, on your journey. So the context here for a dashboard design and prioritizing simplicity is keeping in mind what is that universe? And and for dashboard, the universe is what question are you answering every good dashboard is designed to answer a question. Uh, and it's a, it's a fine balance to provide uh, the user's context without including too much. So constantly ask yourself, what in other information do users need? Uh, the goal is simplicity, uh, embracing the concept of less is more, and, and best practice is usually to reduce if possible and always making sure that you're, you're using the right format. You know, is a, a chart better versus a table, et cetera? And there's essentially three types of dashboards that you can create. Uh, strategic dashboards track uh, KPIs or key performance indicators. Uh, analytical dashboards process data to identify trends. And operational dashboards tell you what is happening now. Uh, and if you try to cross streams between these three, that's when you can get into a little bit of trouble and have, um, you know, some people call it a kitchen sink dashboard. It's everything thrown in there. Um, so focus on uh, what question you're trying to answer and what type of dashboard is it that you're building, strategic, analytical, or operational. Lastly, I'll close with a few resources. As I mentioned, uh, uh, let's say Tableau again a few times. Uh, one of the best resources I've found is the Tableau community, uh, whether you're talking about Tableau user groups, or uh, finding inspirational work out on Tableau Public. The, the entire Tableau community is a great source for uh, resource for dashboard design. And I've got a few books listed here. I'm a big fan of books, although there's a lot of material out on the web. I feel that a you know, published peer reviewed um, hard copy book offers a lot more solid advice sometimes than a, than a fly by night kind of blog. But uh, these are a few, a few of my favorites up here. None of these books are specific to any particular software, but I've got Tufty mentioned again, he's I'd probably consider him the, the godfather of uh, data visualization. Uh, he's published this and this and several subsequently beautifully done books uh, shown here was that first one to really pull together what works well universally into one reference material. Uh, Stephen Few, uh, also another innovator, he introduced the bullet graph uh, and has also published several great books, including two editions of the one I've got listed here. And lastly, uh, Cole Nussbaumer and Affleck, Storytelling with Data. Uh, that book focuses entirely on best practices for presenting data to tell stories. It shares an excellent understanding of why good visualizations matter so much and how to use them uh, to, compel telling, uh, to tell compelling stories that demand action. And she also published a workbook to accompany the main volume. 
And if nothing else, you can do a quick search on dashboard design principles and find an, an ever never ending list of blogs or videos that can help guide you on the way. And that's all I had from my presentation today. So with that, I'll say thank you and open up back to the floor. That was awesome. Uh, thank you, Brian. There were, I feel like there were tons of like, uh, just really good practical pieces in there. Um, and I love the resources at the end because I've, I've read several of those books and found them really useful myself. I feel like people are always looking for like what books to read, what like podcasts to listen to. You pick up a lot just looking at what other people have done and suggestions people have. So, yeah, absolutely. And if anybody ever has a chance to meet Cole, Miss uh, Bomber, and Affleck, uh, she's phenomenal. Um, the other two are not as good in person, uh, but. Uh, she's fantastic. <laughs> right. Yeah, one of those two can be critical with feedback, I think. Right. I think they can both be <laughs> fairly critical. <laughs> but yes. Right. Uh, yeah. Does anyone no, those... anyone have any questions for Brian? I'm looking at the Q and A. If not, no big deal. Brian, I'm curious as you've gone through your own journey. Um, I mean, you mentioned you've kind of been in this game for close to 20 years. Um, like, how have you seen your own career progress, um, you know, leveraging these best practices? Um, I assume part of it, too, is like as you've grown in your career, the audience that you're designing for and creating for kind of continues to ramp itself up. So I'm curious if you have any kind of thoughts on kind of career progression, then also like designing for different audiences. Yeah, that's uh, that's a great question. Yeah, I was I was doing a little bit of reminiscing the other uh, the other night and thinking about what my first real like reporting overhaul project was, and it was when uh, I worked at Circuit City Stores. If you remember that company, I was actually worked in the stores, and then went to the uh, corporate headquarters, and I took over uh, a reporting task from someone who had build been building something in Microsoft Access and. Uh, was printing it out on PDFs and mailing them manually to every single store. After one month of doing that, I was like, I'm not gonna do that anymore. So I, I built you know, kind of an automated process to bring in the data and found a way to feed it to the stores automatically so they could you know, get it printed out on a dot matrix printer, which was you know, kind of you know, still uh, old technology at the time but it challenged me to take that same information and put it into a way that I could put it into this antiquated format that was gonna read better, um, get the information to the people's hands quicker, right? Cause I yep. could, that's something I had to refresh and update and send automatically on a weekly basis versus having to go through this whole uh, antiquated process that took two weeks or whatever, once a month. Uh, so it, it, it really kind of opened my eyes to how data in the hands of the people that need it quickly in a format that makes sense to them and can, can make a difference. And, and everything really did just snowball from there in my career, career progression. And, and things have changed so much since then. I mean, talk about trying to force an access report into a dot matrix printer now to building vis and tooltips kind of stuff. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really fun to look back and see how far things have, have progressed. But yeah, you know, the, uh, the user audience has definitely become more um, uh, sophisticated along the, the way as well and demanding uh, even quicker information, even more actionable insights. Uh, so it's just, uh, you know, tightened up the whole um, beginning to end spectrum from when you, the, the data gets registered when you're putting in into use for, for business purposes. That's awesome. I love you sharing that story. The, the eye roll is for the, the moment that you're printing something and putting it into not email, but like legitimate snail mail, like old school. That is just, I, I didn't, I didn't do that one. So I'm, I'm grateful that there were people like you that, that pioneered those paths, my man. <clears throat> Thank you again. A long time ago. Oh. Yeah. yeah, thanks for having with, me. Appreciate with, it. We all hope we're not going back to those days anytime soon.
Yeah, seriously. Uh. <laughs> well, we will transition. Uh, I would love to take the opportunity to introduce uh, a good friend, uh, now colleague, uh, Jared Flores. Jared um, is a phenomenal contributor to the Tableau community. Um, he has jumped in and done some amazing work in Tableau prep. Um, super humble guy, um, but loves to just share the wealth of information that he has in this space. And so it's an honor and privilege for us to have him with us today. Jared uh, resides in Dallas, Texas. Um, and uh, Jared, we're, we're pumped to have you. Uh, feel free to, to pump the cookie company while you're here as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pumped to be here. Um, talk about Tableau Prep. Uh, yeah, as Nelson mentioned, uh, my wife started a cookie company uh, here locally. Um, you know, we're looking into the option of shipping, but yeah, uh, official good dough is our company. There you go. There you um, go. So yeah. Uh, but yeah. Awesome, man. Uh, yeah. So I, I wanted to um, kind of use this opportunity to do an interactive session. Um, you you can feel free to to join along if you want to. We're going to dive into sort of cleaning your first data set and using a data set that we're all familiar with, which is the uh, sample superstore data set. So let me just uh, share my screen here. All right. Um, so if you want to follow along or just kind of want to take a look at what I'm doing, when you open up Tableau Prep, and I'll go ahead and do it real quick, um, there is this sample flow down here, this superstore flow. So all you need to do is open it up and then control A and delete everything because we're essentially just going to rebuild this flow, um, but we're going to do it a little bit better than they've done it because we're, we're awesome like that. So. Um, if you don't know what Tableau Prep is or haven't used it before, it is Tableau's sort of effort into uh, the click, you know, the drop and click data engineering, um, self-service data cleaning. And it's really useful for a host of things. You know, it does its primary uh, task of cleaning the data, engineering these data sources well, um, but you can use it for a lot of other things too. But, um, you know, let's kind of dive in and see uh, how you would build the sample superstore data set. Um, if you look over here, you've got your connections pane. They've got the look and feel of it similar to the connections in uh, desktop. If you click this plus button here, you can see all of the connections they have it looks exactly the same as it does um, in desktop. And so for this particular data set that we're going to create. We've got CSVs and we've got Excel files. So here we've got um, CSVs or data sets for each of the order regions. We've got this return uh, table and there's this quota table for the second half of this uh, flow. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to get to the second half of it, but we'll at least get through the first half. Um, so again, if you want to follow along, uh, feel free to do so. I'm going to try to go at like medium speed to leave time to do that. Um, but if you just kind of want to see and look ahead at what I'm going to do, just keep that uh, superstore flow, flow open. Um, but let's dive into rebuilding it. So, you know, when you're building new data sets, you want to spend time with them. Uh, if you know sort of what the end goal is, it's a lot easier. But you know, until you spend time sort of creating the data sets, it's harder to visualize what that end goal is. But we know for sample Superstore, it's a table where we've got um, order IDs, product IDs. We've got everything at the, uh, the product level. So you know, products within orders. And we've got the sales. We've got what the product actually is, the region, um, and all of that. And so since we've got these tables, all of the regions split up into their own tables, we wanna combine those together. Um, so we can go ahead and come over here and just drag our tables out onto the pane. Um, so we've got central, actually, you know what? I'm gonna do it in the same order that they've got the sample flow. So we've got south, we've got east, we've got west, and we've got central. 
So here are our four inputs. And so you can come here into the input step and there's things that you could, you could make changes here in the step if you need to, um, but it doesn't actually show you all of the results. It shows you this kind of little preview of these are the values that are gonna be in uh, these columns. It shows you the column types, the field name. And the reason why you see this field name and original field name is first in case you go in and manually rename it. But when you're connecting to your more typical uh, tables in your data warehouses and they've got underscores in them, Tableau will usually automatically rename those fields with um, you know capital case and remove the underscores from them. So that's why they keep that original field name there. So if you wanna take a look at it, we can click here. Um, the, by default, the first step is gonna be this clean step, which really is just a preview of the data. And so if we look in, it shows us the uh, list view and the tabular view. So we've got the profile pane up here and then the table down here. So the profile pane, this is gonna be your most useful asset with Tableau Prep, no matter what you're trying to do. Because if you've looked at the tables before or you've looked at reports with your data before and you kind of have a feel for, this is normally where values fall within, uh, that's what this pane does. It shows you a distribution of the values. So for the quantity field, since this is a number, it's showing a distribution of how many records are falling within this range of values. Um, and then what it's even more useful for is for your string values like these, it shows you how many times that value is appearing in the data set. So let's say over here for order ID, um, if this was something that I knew this needs to be a one for one, um, and I was going through creating my flow, this, and I've, I've got, you know, this has one row, this has two rows. So it, very quickly, you can identify duplicate records and start trying to narrow that down. Um, now, if you look at the flow, the way that Tableau has it built in the sample, you'll see that they've gone in and excluded nulls from the order ID field. Uh, there's a couple ways we can do it, but we'll do it the simple way, which was with the built-in function with these three dots here, there is a filter. I'll come here to null values and I'll say, I want to keep only non-null values. Now there's no nulls in there currently, but maybe as we're building this out, we're anticipating in the future, there might be nulls in there and we don't want them in the final data set. And then we can come up here and rename this to uh, remove nulls. Sorry, can't see my keyboard. Remove nulls. Now they don't have descriptions on the sample flow, but I like to add them for every single step because the more detail you add, the easier it is for um, adoption. And if somebody else is going to maintain it in the future, they can jump right in, understand what you were doing and why you were doing it. So we'll say uh, keep, oops, keep only non-null uh, records from the order ID field. Boom, there we go. So now it's very clear what this field is doing. Um, I'll move these down. So now, um, another thing that we can do just to kind of clean up the flow and keep it nice and clean is we can rename these. So we'll call this orders south and orders east, orders west, west, and order central. And again, this is just to, it's not necessary but the cleaner your flows are, um, you know, the easier it is to jump back into them and it keeps it more uniform. And so for the east, we can jump in here. Now in the sample flow, what they've done is they've changed the discount type. Um, it's not actually necessary. I don't know, you know, they changed it to string and, and there's some things in the sample flow that are really only done just to showcase here is some functionality that that prep can do. And so that's why I kind of wanted to dig into rebuilding it to show what we should actually do if we were building out this data source. Um, so we know that we're gonna union these tables together. And in order to do that, we want our field types to be the same. Um, so if I click back into the first one and go to this third option right here, uh, it's show list view. This will just give me a list of the fields and their types in the, um, 
the view, and then if there's any changes, it'll quickly highlight those here. But for discount, discount is a number, decimal number, that makes sense. So it should stay the same in this flow. Um, now sales, it's a string. And so if we look back at our profile, if I come over here, I can see that sales has these USD uh, string values in there. We don't want that. Um, but again, prep makes this very easy to clean. I can click on these three dots, go to clean, remove letters. And so now all of the letters have been removed. And if you wanted to see what that prep actually did, you can come over here, click on the edit button, and this is the calculation that it used. So it's just a uh, regular expression replace. Uh, so you could manually type it out if that's faster for you and you know what you're doing as you get more familiar with it. Um, so it's always interesting to kind of get under the hood and see what prep did, but you can just click on that little menu function and it's there. Uh, the type is still string, so you can just click this and change it to a uh, number decimal. And now it's the same. So come back here and say fix data type. And again, um, move letters from the sales field and change to number type. Boom. All right, now let's go to West. So for West, in the sample flow, you can see that they've renamed the states, but in the actual changes pane, it says the values were grouped. Um, so another interesting thing that you can do, um, but actually before we do that, let me jump back real quick. Um, when we union these together, we want all of the fields to be the same uniform, and we, so we wanna have the same number of fields. When we look at the first one, there's 21 fields. Second one, 21 fields. In the West table, there's 41 fields. Um, and then if we look, we can see that there are these, um, there's all of these columns that have right underscore in front of them. So we don't need those. And so we can actually go and remove those in the input step. And so I can come here and all of them are checked right now, but I can start unchecking them to uh, get them removed from the flow. And the reason why, if you know, if you're familiar with your data, um, it's good to make any sort of um, exclusions of fields or really any action transformation the, as early as you can in the flow because once your organization starts using prep um, maybe you've got prep conductor you're scheduling flows you're scaling with prep um, flows run in order they, they run one at a time so the more simple that you can make your flows the more performant you can make them um, the better. So that's why if we do it earlier, it's not going to take as long to process because it's not processing those unnecessary fields throughout the rest of the flow. So cool. We've um, removed those fields. Now, if I go back here, uh, cool. We've got 21 fields. Okay. Now we can go to the state renaming. So if I come over here to the right, the state field, it's got state abbreviations. Um, but if we go back up to the first two, the East and the South sales, states are listed here with the full state name. Prep makes this super easy. Instead of having to do a really long if or case statement of if it's this abbreviation, do the full name, I can actually just come over here to the state field and just replace the name. So I can call that Arizona. So this makes it very easy and simple to um, replace these values. And so if there are situations where values are gonna come in one way um, and you know you, we need to do a substitution for that um, and it's always gonna be that substitution, this is a real quick way to fix that. So type those here. It's going to take prep a second to catch up. Um, this is also, you know, as you're kind of working through these these flows, um, the data sampling can be real important. When you bring in an input, automatically, if you go to here, the data sample, it, it's going to take a default sample. Um, and the, the method of quick select, what it tries to do is it tries to kind of take a look at the shape and the distribution of the values of the data and take a sample that makes the most sense because prep loads uh, every change that you do, any, any action, calculation, removal, it's loading as you're going through. Um, 
So just kind of keep that in mind as you're working through it. And that data sample, that box is very important to keep in mind when you're trying to validate results um, because it's not going to line up exactly since it's taking a sample unless you go into all of your inputs and click use all data. Your flow is going to take longer to run, but that will allow you to actually validate your results. Okay, so we renamed those states. We'll call this rename states. And we'll say um, rename the state abbreviations. Probably spelling that wrong. Cool, one more. All right, so for the central field, if you look at the sample, there's a lot of stuff going on there. Um, but really, when we look at the uh, rows, there's 24 fields here, so there's some extra fields. Um, and when we look, we've got this order year, month, day, and ship year, month, day, instead of an order date and a ship date field. So if we go back to this one, there is an order date field and a ship date field. Now in the sample, what they've done is they've turned each of those fields into a string. So they make one string calculation and wrap the order, the month, and the day in a string, and then add the uh, slash mark in between. So they create the, uh, the string field first, and I'll actually copy and paste that over here so we can see what that looks like. So this is what is in the sample. So they first, they say, hey, we'll make this an order date. Cool. And now we've got this um, order date field. It's a string value. We can change the type to date. So that's the way it's done in the sample. But really, the more um, efficient way to do this is to use the make date function. So we can come in here and say make date. And we've got our order year. Order year. Order month and order day. And this works well because those three columns are already a number type. And this uh, calculation needs a number type to work right out of the box. So order year, month, day, that's our order date, save. And so in one step, we've done the same thing. So we don't have to go through and change the type. And so we can do the same thing for our ship date. And we'll say make date, uh, order year, oops, order month and order day, oops, ship, sorry. Ship year, ship month, and ship day. All right, so there is our ship date and our order date fields. So now that those are created, um, we don't really need the uh, extra fields anymore. So we can come over here, Go click control and click these six fields because we don't need them. Come up here, remove fields. Boom. So those have been removed from the flow. Um, if we take a look at our list view, let's make sure on types. So it looks like sales, quantity, and profit are all numbers. That's good. But discounts is a string. So let me go and make sure that there's no weird values in there that's going to cause some errors. Um, it looks like the only weird value is this none, but when we change this to a number, that's going to turn into null. And so we'll take this, turn it into a decimal. And there we go. Now we've got uh, the same types. So I can come in here, call this uh, fixed states. And again, with the descriptions, you can get as detailed or, or non-detailed as you want. So we'll say create a ship and order date and remove the unnecessary Oops. And then uh, change discount to number. I believe one of these fields is also named incorrectly. Um, yeah, so the product field and the first three tables, it is called product name. And so we want to match that up. And so let's call this actually, you know what, we can take a preview at something real quick before we rename that. Um, let's do our union so we can click here and you can either add the union step this way, or when you drag this on, it'll ask you if you want to join or union. So we'll do union. Um, I'm also particular about the shape of my flows. You don't have to be. And so we can just drag all of those to our union. And now when we click on it, it's gonna immediately highlight 
here are fields that are mismatched. And so for discount, it looks like in the first three tables, it's matching up, but for the last table, um, it's actually called discounts. And then same for product, it was fine in the first three, but in the last one, it's called product. So we need to change that to product name. And then there is no region field in the last table. So real quick, we can come in here, say region, and we know this is coming from the central region. So we can just call this central as a text value, save, and we can come over here. Um, and we can, do, we can do it this way, where we come in here and we rename the field here, which is probably the cleaner way to do it. Um, but then if we come here, we know that discount and discounts are the same field. And so we could uh, come over here and click the two fields and merge them. And they should merge as discount. Yep, there we go. Um, so either way works. Uh, it's probably better practice to make sure that your names are lining up, but that's again, the usefulness of prep. It's gonna highlight all of these things really quickly for you. So we'll call this uh, orders or all orders. Oh, let's call it orders. Cool. Description, union, all order tables together. Um, so next, there is a join happening to the returns table. So if we come here, here's our returns input. Let's drag that in. And it dropped down here. So I'll drag this up here real quick and we'll name it the same returns all. And then when we look uh, in the sample, they only included a few fields here. So just um, order ID, product ID, um, return reason, and notes. I believe those are the four fields. Yeah. So um, let's go into our clean. And what's happening in the sample is these notes are formatted as the reason first, then this hyphen, then the approver. And so to split those, there's a really easy function here. If it's up here, you can see automatic and custom split. And so we'll do custom split. We'll split on that hyphen. And then I want the, there could be more hyphens in there um, that I don't want to include. And so we'll just say, I want the first two splits. So what that's gonna do is it's gonna give me the result, the string that comes before that hyphen and the string that comes after it. So, and then you can see here, if you wanna pop the hood, uh, there is, it's just the trim and split function. And so it's just splitting it on that character and then trimming any extra leading or, or um, following spaces off of it. Um, and so we've got that split. And so now we can rename this field approver and we can rename this field return notes. We can take this original notes field and remove it. We no longer need it. But then if you look at the approver field, there's all of these records that aren't quite spelled exactly the same, but they should be the same. Um, and so we can use preps grouping function. We can come in here to the three dots, go to group values. Um, and I think we'll have the most success if we group them on spelling since they're so close in spelling. So we'll click that and boom, there you go. You can click in each one. It'll show you which of the values fell within the grouping. So nice and easy. We don't have to do any calculation. And you can also decrease or increase the strength of how it's processing those. Um, so if you've got some really crazy spellings or numbers or some stuff happening in there, you might need to increase the strength. But if you increase it too much, it's gonna start really kind of stretching on how it's grouping those values. So you can kind of play with that. And then you can also, if you needed to, manually include other records um, that need to be in there. So we've grouped. We'll call this uh, split and group, uh, split the notes field and group all names to remove duplicates. Perfect. And so now, if you look at the sample flow, um, the join that's happening is highlighted as a right join. That's what that Venn diagram is. So since the right side is filled in with color, that's a right join. Um, but I typically like to flow, this is, you know, more of a personal preference really, but I like to make sense of my flow. And so here are my inputs. They're all coming together here. And I want them to continue with that flow. This is my main table orders is my main table. So really ideally I would like it to be, um, on the left side, just because that makes you know more sense as it's flowing through. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to drag it on 
And so now orders is going to be on the left side. If I come in here, so orders is on the left and the split in group is on the right because I took that um, this orange pill and I joined it to the orders table. So that's why it put this one on the left and this one to the right. And so we want to do a left join. Um, also, just a real quick overview of the join types. You've got standard inner join, standard left, standard right. You've got full outer, but then a uh, very useful one is you can do not inner. Um, so this will highlight here are all of the records that don't match um, on both sides, or you can do um, left only. So we're going to join on these and any records that match are going to be excluded. We only want records, records from the left table that don't match the other one. So just a couple of interesting ways to solve some, some problems or to clean up your data dynamically um, with these other joins. So, but we want left join and we want to join on product ID and order ID. And so what this down here is going to show, it's going to show our, our join summary. It's going to show how many rows were included from both tables and then how many were excluded. And so if there was um, a need for all of your rows to match up and you were doing an inner join, for example, and you saw all of these excluded rows, um, you can click on one of them. So we'll go back here real quick and let's click on the 22 excluded rows. And so it's going to bring those up immediately. And so now if I was trying to do some validation and find out why are these not showing up, I can take those and maybe query my database and try to figure out what's going on. Why aren't these joining up? So we will do call this one uh, orders plus turns. And we'll see, I'm just gonna copy and paste this over for time's sake. All right, so here is our orders and return table. Now in the flow as well, you see this uh, clean two step and all that's really happening there is there's some fields being removed and renamed. And the reason is because when I come here back into my join step, if I go to list view, uh, we've got the colors here which represent the color of where they came from. So uh, this uh, teal is coming from the union and this orange is coming from the returns table. And so since we're joining on product ID and order ID, there is this uh, duplicate order ID and product ID coming from the returns table. Now in the sample flow, uh, the duplicate fields are removed. Uh, so order ID field one is actually the order ID field coming from the orders table in the sample flow and same for product ID it's the product ID coming from the orders table in the sample flow. Now I know since we just did a left join we're bringing in all records from the orders table and only the matching records from this return table, so I don't really need these two duplicate fields. I'm expecting there to be some nulls in them since it's a this is coming from the right table they're not all going to match and so i'm just going to remove them here in the join step. So again, the simpler that you can make your flow, um, the more efficient it will be, and that is our superstore data set and if we look at it, here we go, you can see not every order had a return, but those that did have the approver and the notes in there. Um, we've got our orders we've got our states everything lines up so. That is, you know, really just a quick overview into what prep can do and engineering these data sets. One thing to keep in mind, though, while it's very good and useful for engineering data sets, it's also extremely useful for validation. If you are going through the process of like maybe changing the logic that forms a table, um, you can say, OK, here was the original logic. Let me connect to that. Let me connect to my new logic and see, you know, connect using that um, that uh, not inner join and that will sh highlight hey here are all of the records that no longer match because you implemented new logic. I use this all of the time for validation, because instead of me having to, you know, make that logic change then query it then pull it up in tableau and try to visualize and see okay the numbers are off and dig in that way, I can just do it like this and dig in before I actually make any changes. Um, so, you know, 
PrEP is powerful on both ends for creating the data, but for validating the data and to also really understand what you need to do to create your data set forces you to spend that time with it. Um, and you can more quickly visualize, you know, when you've got a bunch of different sources of data, um, since I've used prep before, I kind of have come become a little bit familiar with some of those nuances. I know what I want this end state to be. And so all of the steps in between are just a matter of getting to that end state. Um, so, you know, it also, when you've spent time building a data set, it, as you go through these steps, you see some of that distribution, you see these fields, the way they're formatted. So by the time you take this output, throw it in the desktop, you kind of already have an idea of what you can do with it and um, you know what, how it's gonna be most effective. Uh, one last caveat to be careful of. One of, you know, one of the benefits of prep is that you can sort of pre-aggregate your data and make it to where in desktop, you're not connecting to all of this data at the most granular level. If you don't need it, you get more um, performant workbooks, but there is always the danger of over aggregating and like doing percentage calculations directly in the data set. Now they're probably not gonna aggregate properly um, in desktop unless you're filtering to that level of granularity. Or maybe you're calculating an average in the data set. And now when you throw it into desktop, you're doing an average of an average. So just be cautious not to over aggregate. Do as much as you can get it to, you know, where Tableau maybe just handles that final aggregation to make sure that any filtering or um, you know, actions are gonna aggregate properly. Um, but yeah, that's just one thing to be cautious of because there's always the uh, the urge to make the data set as small and, and compact as possible, but then you lose some of the power of desktop in doing that. But uh, yeah, I uh, hope uh, I was able to get in depth enough and you were able to follow along if you wanted to. Um, yeah, there's plenty, plenty of uh, potential for prep and plenty of ways to grow with it. Um, one thing I will leave you with, um, it's not a fancy slide or anything, but this is just a um, quote that has resonated very well with me, and I'll just throw it up here for y'all. Um, it's a quote from Stephen Covey. You know, anytime you jump into learning something, you can put some pressure on yourself, um, and you can start to be, you know, really sort of be your your uh, your worst advocate sometimes and talk yourself down. So when you're learning something, be patient with yourself. Give yourself the opportunity to be proud of whatever pace you learn it at. That's all I have for y'all. This is awesome, sorry. man. I, I learned a bunch. Yeah, that was awesome. And I love your quote. Yes, it's uh, like I said, it's, it's definitely one that resonated with me. There was a couple of times um, when I did my 100 day challenge where life got busy and I was like, oh man, I, may, I might miss a day. And so now it's not technically 100 days, but you know, I, I just started you know, realizing I'm really doing this for me, to learn for me. And so as long as I'm proud of the progress I'm making, that's okay. It's okay that sometimes stuff gets in the way, but I'm still making that effort. I'm not giving up, I'm still learning. Exactly. Love that. So we've got a question for you, Jared, real quick. How does Tableau Prep stack up against other tools like an Alteryx, Airflow, any other tools like how, in your opinion uh for me i think you know one of the the right off the bat is if your tableau desktop if that's your tool of choice your visualization tool it just integrates really well with it it integrates with their they've got prep conductor um and the data management add-on so it integrates with the environment well um and also i think the most powerful thing that the, the advantage for prep is this um this profile pane Right, being able to directly see the distribution and kind of um, when you're doing joins, quickly identifying duplicates, that's where the advantage is for me. Um, and also, when you compare it to tools like like Alteryx, there are some things that you can do in prep in one step that in Alteryx takes you, you know, maybe three or four steps to do. Now, for you know ease of maintainability or transferring hands, that might be better. Um, depending on the organization, but um, for me, it's an advantage because I can kind of work through it, through it faster. But um, like I said, for 
there's still um, a lot of disadvantages of prep too. Um, there's it, there's definitely room for it to catch up, um, especially when you think about yes, it integrates well with Tableau, but um, it doesn't always integrate well with other things. Um, so that's just one of the sort of disadvantages of it at the moment. Yeah, it was awesome. I loved the, uh, there were some parts where you were kind of redoing fields and kind of reconnecting things. And like, uh, to your point there, I was like, oh, that's really simple right there. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, uh, there's definitely room to appreciate it for sure. Um, and I think the other thing I would say too, is there are definitely use cases I've seen where if the, the transformation is not just like, like an enterprise level, um, and you're not trying to do things on, you know, really small headways or, or real time. Um, there's some really nice use cases when you pair prep with uh, Tableau conductor um, on the server where it's like, you know, it's going to run it for you. Um, and like Tableau's ability to um, handle the drivers and stuff like that is uh, it's a lot better than uh, some other tools and whatnot that are out there. So there's definitely advantages to be had. And yeah, and I would say one last advantage as well over maybe some of the other tools is a uh, learning curve. We've, you know, I've heard it from a few people that, you know, I tried Tableau prep and I tried Altrix and I really like Altrix, but Tableau prep was just, it was just quicker for me to learn. <laughs> that's um, cool. So, you know, that's another thing out there. Love that. Yeah, I would add that if your data is in a database and you're outputting to Tableau, either Tableau Server or Tableau Online, then Tableau Prep is perfect. If you need to go pull an API and run some advanced analytics and then output it to you know, somewhere else um, or a certain file type other than CSV or Hyper, uh, then yeah, Alteryx would, would win that battle, so. Yeah, and I think, you know, especially they've talked about um, really increasing the uh, the development arm of prep and opening that up the same way that we have extensions in desktop, they want to open up extensions in prep and really give uh, any developers control over the UI itself. And so we may see some things like API connectors come out of that. Um, I would imagine the community would jump on that and start making up for areas where prep hasn't always served the need. That's yeah. cool. I love the visual nature of prep. Yeah, that's you why know, I little said visualization, the interactivity. Awesome. Yeah, I, I, I'm very particular about how my flows look, um, but I know that it doesn't really matter because when you close it out and open it up, it's probably going to rearrange everything anyways. But it, it's just nice to be able to visually make sense of here is how the data is flowing. Absolutely. And if you didn't get enough of Jared today, Come back during the Tableau conference. Uh, Jared's going to be speaking there. Um, and so we're super excited about that, man. Congrats on that opportunity. Yeah, this is you. fantastic. Thank Jared you. Jared also has a YouTube channel. Have you promoted that yet? Ooh, no. Come on, yeah, man. Yes, I have Don't a hold back. YouTube channel. Um, my, my series is called Put Some Prep in Your Step, uh, and it's dedicated to learning all things Tableau prep. I am actually about to um, sort of revamp and relaunch my series basically starting like this because when I launched it, it was more um, tips and use cases. So now we're, I'm gonna start focusing on what is Tableau prep from beginning to end and really diving into um, being able to almost like an informal course of, if I wanted to learn Tableau prep, how do I jump into it? So it's a lot of stuff there. Um, when there is new features in the quarterly releases, I'll also release a video kind of highlighting what those features are and, and why they're good or not so good. Awesome. And people can follow you at what the uh, viz on Twitter. Uh, viz what? Viz what? That's right. Love it. Thank you, Jared. This was great. Awesome. Is it time for Kahoot? Nathan? It is. Kahoot, Kahoot time. I'm going to share my screen, share my sound, coming at you. That's good. All right. So there will be a $30 gift certificate for Tableau for the top three winners. So be sure to participate.
All right, so you guys know what to do. Pull up your mobile phones, go to kahoot.it. Well, I love that but, they now have the QR code. Is that new or am I just uh, oblivious? I think that's new. That's pretty slick. Oh, here you go. Boom. Uh, boom. Oh, that's sick. I'm here for it. Now I don't have to do anything. It's put that thing in. And Anna's yeah. not here, so you don't have to keep your, your username super family friendly. <laughs> The school Nathan, teacher's not I'm here. not so wholesome set of Brini says. <laughs> Do whatever you want to, people. <laughs> I'm on with it. Uh, Ooh, how many, Karen's I'm playing. Curious, She's ready. <laughs> I'm curious, Brian. Brian, how many times have you won? Um, At least once or twice. I think twice, I've right? gotten a prize. I think I've gotten a prize three times, maybe. Two or three Man. times. Man. I got yes, a and, and uh, a hoodie. Brian, I, oh. I have to confess, I literally just put two and two together on that. So in my head, I go, oh, he's that guy. <clears throat> uh, he's the guy, Congratulations. He's the That's guy that always like, kicks all of our tails. <laughs> I, I'm laying off this time. I'm, it's a bye okay. week for me. It's going to be okay. awesome. Yeah, so there's one extra spot on the podium today, guys. <laughs> 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 all right yeah there's someone else who wins pretty often too who is that we had that one guy that was from like uh new zealand or something uh, oh yeah yeah remember we him met at tabo conference and he kept him in tabo? Tags. yeah <laughs> forget his name and we're like we're not shipping you a shirt halfway across the world dude i'm sorry True story that would have been like a thousand dollar shipping fee pluto. <laughs> pluto that's right yeah that's it pluto if you're on we love you we hope to see you at table conference or inspire where i'll be unfortunately i mean fortunately i mean i don't know i mean <laughs> okay. uh, all right well we got got some people Looks like half of you are analytic vision. Cool. All right, last couple of seconds to join. We're While we're started. waiting on people to join, there was a message like in the Q and A. Um, I'll drop this in the chat, but there's oh, a the link. job opportunity. Yeah, a yeah, job that's... opportunity. At the Intercontinental Exchange. Yes. Looks like a pretty cool role. Yeah, so check the chat. We've got a link to the role. Mm -hmm. um, awesome. All right, well, we can go and get started. Uh, you can join. If you're not on, you can join as we go. Uh, here we go. You guys hear the music? Is it loud enough? I no. can hear it. That's turned up. Quiet. All right. When was the first Tableau conference? What year? Mm. Is that coming through now? Yes. Barely. You can turn up more if you want. Uh oh. Now we're here. All right. What year was it? 2008. Nice. A nice uh, normal distribution. <laughs> uh nelson where was said 2008 conference it was in seattle were you there i was not there though no uh, my first one was 2013 jen was paul lisborg there he might have been i bet you he was if there's anybody who, who was there it's either andy or paul i Bruh. think andy was there dan murray was there i know that that's yep. awesome all right, bro, in the lead. All right, number two, the Zen Master title has been changed to something more politically correct. Like the Tableau of Pope. That would be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> that's funny. Tableau of Pope. Yeah, that's <laughs> Anna all, all for you. So. <laughs> So we had zero, zero votes for the Pope. Uh, 
Sorry about that. I, I nixed that one. <laughs> yeah, so if you don't know, it's how a Zen master now uh, visionary. And it's like the top 30 to 50 people in the world uh, for using the tool and com uh, contributing to the community, uh, among other things. So it's a pretty elite list. All right, true or false? You can name dashboard containers whatever you want, as long as the symbol exists on your keyboard. <laughs> what is that, Jeff? <laughs> Great. Thanks, Chappelle's print. <laughs> Serving pancakes. All right. So I, I'm assuming Brian taught us that one. I missed the first presentation. Uh, but yeah, uh, name your containers. Me. Not me. No, I did not know that one. This is a, this is an Anna Ford special right here. <clears throat> Anna Ford special. All right. Let's see. Does bro make it back up? No. Oh, come on, bro. <laughs> Jay Lee. Jay Lee and JB in the top. Here we go. To create a custom color palette in Tableau, add the colors HTML format to the TPS report for sure. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Did you the cover pages now? Oh man. Yeah. It's a very informed crew right here. Yeah, so that file is in your Tableau repository, and uh, you can Google how to add the little code snippets to uh, make your own preferences. Custom color palettes. Jay Lee holding strong. Prep star Jared right on somebody's heels. A lot of right. J's. Yeah. Which fonts are supported in Tableau Online on both PC and Mac? across all browsers. This one, if you've been paying attention to the Twitter sphere of the data fam, uh, there's some, some posts going around yesterday about this, so. Look at that. Yeah, so uh, this is a, you know, Ariel, Georgia, Verdana. There's a few others, so Tableau fonts, obviously. Georgia is a winner, but Gotham's not. Trebuchet MS, I forget. Tableau New, Times New Roman. Yeah, so there's a certain group of fonts. It's like eight to 10 fonts that will work on uh, PC and Mac when once published in Tableau Online. Um, there's lots of horror stories about people uh, you know, publishing their iron viz with, you know, some special font and then it renders as Times New Roman and looks terrible. So, all right, well, that's here we go. Number six. Moment, isn't it? What is the purpose of Tableau prep? <laughs> I'm going to file my taxes with Tableau prep for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Wow. <laughs> What a question. I don't know if we've ever had a, a 100. That's a slow clap. That's nice. Jared, that's you're... effective teaching right there. <laughs> that is fantastic <laughs> teaching. Well done. Well done. Jared, you get an A plus, man. Good job. Good job. Oh, look, and you made it back. Had a look at my man popping up. <laughs> Let's uh, go. All right, here we go. Here we go. Two more questions to get on the podium. What do you need in order to share and manage data flows at scale? Do you need the prep pipe, the prep caboose, the prep engine, mm. prep conductor? Prep engine would, would be a good one from a naming. All about prep caboose, kind of coming in at the end there. Yeah, nobody bit that one. Exactly. Prep conductor. Oh. Mm, here we go. All right, last question. Here we go. What was Tabo Prep's code name during the beta period? Ooh, that was. We will call it Enigma. <laughs> <laughs> Could have called it Data Laser. <laughs> data Laser. I guess if everyone answers, it just goes ahead and ends it. That's awesome. All right. You are correct, Project Maestro. 
Well, here we go. Oh, Kui Wen. JB. JB. And the winner, Jay Lee. All right, guys. <clears throat> uh, some runners up, Pet Star and Bigger. Good old Matt Bigger. All right, guys. Uh, if you and we do need, we need emails for the winners. Yeah. Yes. Send your email address to the hosts and presenters in the chat, please. And that's it for me. Thanks for joining, Jim, as everyone. Always. And thank you, guys. Thanks, Brian and Jared. You guys were awesome. Thank you. Thanks yeah. for having me. Hey, yeah. y'all go ahead and uh, mark your calendars, uh, Tableau Conference, uh, be there, be virtual. Uh, and then July 12th, uh, somebody check me on this. I think it's a Tuesday. Um, so go ahead and put that on the calendar. Uh, either you can call in sick. Uh, I wouldn't advise that. Don't do that. Um, <laughs> or just tell your people that you're going to go see human beings face to face. It's going to be fantastic. Um, and so make that thing happen. Uh, so All super right. Fun. Just so... So everyone's aware the winner was JLE. That's James Emery. So congrats. Ooh. Excellent. James Emery. Dude, it's good to hear from you, buddy. I uh, love that. I need JB's email so we can send you some money. Yeah, we can't turn we can't turn this thing off until we get J, JB's email. Uh, yeah, I think that's all we got. We'll hang out for a minute uh, if you have any questions. But um, thanks, as always, for joining us this afternoon. Big yeah. thank you to Jen Lisborg and Anna Ford, and, uh, Karen, Nathan, and to our presenters, Brian and Jared. Um, Taran, who always helps us out with the AV stuff, getting stuff posted up to uh, LinkedIn. Um, and if you need us, hit us up on Slack. I think it's still rock and roll. Or hit us up in LinkedIn land or just reach out. So. And, our, and our second place winner was Joseph Berkman. Birchman's at ICE. So Ooh, there you go. Yep. Who, uh, you could go work with the uh, Silver Place winner. Well, clearly they know their tableau at ICE. So. <laughs> they sure do. So he's hiring for senior yeah. developer, data analytics, and BI. So. Do it. Cool. All right, guys, we're out of here. <clears throat> Thanks, y'all. Appreciate you. Bye, everyone. All right. Bye. Bye.